the one thing I've had a little trouble with, I mean, I think it's great data. I agree with that spectacular, you know, absolute difference uh, in invasive disease-free survival um, with that extra year. How do we explain the ER HER2 interaction here? That yeah. it only seems to have that benefit in the HER2 positive. I mean, the ER positive, HER2 positive. Well, be, be, I just wanted to yeah, say one before, because we'll get, get the, the biology, but <coughs> the ER negative subset is interesting because it splits at about a year into the study. It splits, you've got that delta of about 2.5%, then the curves come back together again. And it's, it raises the question, at least in my mind, for patients whose cancers have um, persisted in spite of chemotherapy and trastuzumab, so they don't have that cancer that can die really easily. Um, whether it's you know it's, it's more it needs to be longer you know maybe it was chronic maybe, maybe if you kept it going longer period of time because that's really bad if these patients still have persistent you know get preoperative and they still have persistent ER negative disease um, that's a very poor prognosis so that's that, so though the data are not impressive so far with the year of um, neuratinib no question in the ER negative. I think it raises the hypothesis for a longer period of treatment. And I think endocrine therapy, again, just to continue to use that, one of the big themes at this year's meeting, plenary abstract one, is if you have a targeted therapy and patients, you know, we just don't know who has residual disease. Mm -hmm. One day we will. We'll have a scanner. We'll put the patient through. You're done. You know, you don't need any more. Right. But today we don't. So we treat 100 patients to offer benefits somewhere between two to four. That's two and out I, of 100. Yeah. Right. And I, I honestly, I think, you know, a year probably for HER2 addicted disease that's residual, it's not going to enough, right? Those are the patients that if we knew they had residual disease, we'd continue Although, forever. interestingly, that's, you know, who? the HERA was, was negative for the two years, interestingly yeah. enough. Yeah. You know, so and there was no difference know. in the year positive. So the one thing that I think we'll have to sort of put this into context is, you know, where does this fall if you're using neoadjuvant pertuzumab? You know, is the benefit going to be the same in patients yeah. with neoadjuvant trastuzumab? Is it more for patients who have residual disease post um, neoadjuvant therapy? You know, should that uh, be the, the sort of the consideration? What level of disease burden with ER positive uh, breast cancer should one be considered? Because yeah. on the other side, we're looking at, you know, so for some of our ER positive T1A, T1B, T1C, maybe some T2s. We're giving paclitaxel, trastuzumab, four cycles, you know, again, sort of de-escalating treatment. Right. And on the other hand, we're giving anthracycline, taxin, pertuzumab, trastuzumab, nanoratinib. You know, there is, how do we sort of balance that scale and how do we sort of define those, <laughs> those patients? Again, I think if this drug does get FDA approved, it yeah. looks like it's kind of on the way. I mean, I think that, you know, we yeah. don't know. That's kind of where I'm thinking. I'm thinking of the patient with a fairly high disease burden after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Say someone who presents either that uncommon adjuvant patient now who has a lot of nodes that's triple positive. I think that's kind of where I would place this in my regimen, you know, eventually. Because I, actually it's going to be those triple positive patients who are going to be the ones who have residual disease. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not really going to yeah. be those tri yeah. the, the yeah. ER negative HER2 positives. Right. See, I'm yeah. a little different. I'm going to wait for my scanner my super oh, really? scanner that I put the patients through. So I'm going to feel obligated, if it's approved, to discuss it with pretty much all Everybody. the patients because How do you feel we people? just don't know. I think we think we know, but I don't think no, we no, really but, know. But I agree with what I think you said, is that, or maybe you said, Kim, that it is, you see it in the ER positive because those are the ones who are at a possibility, at a, have late recurrences. Right. Therefore, you can see that window. Uh, but so you don't think also, there's something scientific behind it? There's some sort I can of speculate. Yeah. I can speculate on all kinds of things. We are <laughs> not encumbered by any data. But um, <laughs> but let's say let's say that the majority of the recurrences are in the brain. Yeah. Which may well be. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I know the the brain is a, a site that has high levels of neuregulin. We know that ligands are a mechanism of escape, and that's one mechanism where uh, addition of a small molecule that draws heterodimerization would be particularly effective, like neuratinib. So again, this is just pure speculation, but, uh, but like Kim, I would be, uh, uh, I, would be uh, I would have to discuss it with a patient yeah. with, with a high burden disease, triple positives, that did not achieve neoadjuvant uh, pathological response after, after TCHB, for example. And I think we have to wait the results of the adjuvant pertuzumab study to really even start to have that discussion, how I would position neuratinib with the results. No, but they'll use the pertuzumab yeah. already in the no, clinical setting, right? In the neoadjuvant. Yeah. So two quick